Aloha Kako. My name is Justin Park. I am the co-founder of Bar Leather Apron here in downtown Honolulu. And today uh, we will be doing our Lexus Lux Masterclass with all of you at home. I just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, it's a great honor to do this in front of everyone, not only in Hawaii, but our outer islands and, and around the world, to be honest. Um, but let's just dive right in. So we're going to start by dissecting the kit. Or if you didn't pick up a kit, um, now's the time you want to get the list of ingredients you procured together. Uh, but we'll go through everything to make sure we have everything. So we're going to start off with uh, our Knob Creek Single Barrel Bourbon. This is going to be one of the bottles in your kit. Next up, we have a uh, Wasan Bone Sugar. Now, Wasan Bone is a Japanese cane sugar. We'll get a little bit more into detail on that in a second. This other, other bottle here, uh, the dark colors, is vermouth. Uh, vermouth is a fortified wine, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We have Kohana, which is a Hawaiian agricole rum. This is made here on the island of Oahu. Agricole rum, I love it so much, I was straight going to talking about it. We'll talk about it when we get into the cocktail, which features that Kohana. And I have a little sugar syrup, one to one, which means equal parts sugar and water. Also in your kit, there should be a little bag. This contains all the garnishes for the cocktails. Now, um, we put little slits for you to rip and open to, to get everything out very easily. Uh, I'm gonna go to this top here. These are just orange peels. We're gonna trap the aroma of the orange over top of one of the cocktails. This is a, a bitter called Angostura. So this is the key ingredient in the first cocktail. So you can get that, get that out and get that ready. Uh, and then we have these two, some dehydrated uh, seasoned lime wheels and a little bit of sugar cane. That's gonna be next for the, the second cocktail, or I should say the third cocktail we do. But I'm gonna set that aside. I, I've already uh, plated all of these, so I'll get them all out here ready for you. Okay, so we're gonna go to the, uh, the BLA Old Fashioned to get started. Now, the Old Fashioned, one of my favorite cocktails was the cocktail my business partner Tom and I came up with before uh, the concept of leather apron even existed. And it's essentially comprised of four ingredients or four elements, spirit, sugar, bitters, and water. So every, every ingredient plays such an important role in the cocktail. It was very important for us to choose um, those ingredients with that in mind. So <clears throat> the first ingredient, which is gonna be this uh, Knob Creek single barrel bourbon. Now, this is what the bottle looks like in the bar. This is what the bottle looks like in the kit or whatever bourbon that you decided to use. We chose to use this Knob Creek Single Barrel for a few re reasons. The flavor profile, um, really on point with what we were looking for to feature as our house old fashioned. Carries the name of our bar, so it's, it's pretty important. And also like the ability to choose kind of our own flavor profile of the bourbon. <clears throat> now what that means is single barrel just means everything in this whiskey bottle came from one barrel. Um, if, there, if single barrel is not written on the bottle, for the most part, it's many barrels mixed together for a consistent flavor and, and then bottled. So we actually try through a few samples that Knob Creek send over to us and pick, pick the sample that we enjoy the best and then we buy the whole barrel. They bottle the whole barrel for us and send it over to all the way over here to Hawaii. But the whole point of it is, other than it being really cool, which it is, is the fact that it's, a, it's a, like our own flavor profile. We chose it. So, <clears throat> okay, so we'll just get straight into the first cocktail here. What you're gonna need is a mixing glass, something like this. You guys all have this at your house, right? This exact one from Japan? No, just kidding. Or you can use something like a, um, a pint glass or any glass of any sort. You just want something you're gonna be able to, to stir in. So, you know, stirring the contents of, of the cocktail along with ice. I'm gonna use the mixing glass for the sake of the video, but you can use whatever you have. The next thing you'll need is a little bit of ice and all the ingredients to, to, my, to my left. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by adding a little bit of ice to this mixing glass here. Now, when you think of ice, you have to think of it when it comes to cocktails beyond um, just keeping the drink cold. It, it, it plays a, the role of dilution in the cocktail. So when I talked about spirit, sugar, bitters, and water, water is a very important element of the cocktail. So too much water in a cocktail becomes over diluted and unenjoyable too little becomes too strong and also unenjoyable. So um, kind of the fun thing about doing this at your house is that you're able to add a little bit more as you go. If, if, if you are gonna do that, I would recommend building it with no ice, then adding the ice and then stirring it. Just because uh, the ice will melt once you start putting things over it and then water becomes a part of the cocktail. So I'm gonna get our Knob Creek single barrel bourbon. <clears throat> now what I have here is a jigger. 
Now a jigger is a, a measuring cup essentially. This is a one that we use at the bar here at Leather Apron, but it has measuring points on the, on the jigger here to show me as I'm pouring it, how much I'm adding to the cocktail. Where it's not necessary at home, um, if you do have something like a tablespoon, one tablespoon roughly equals half of an ounce. So as we go through the, through the uh, cocktail and the ingredients, um, it, it would help you out. And I'd, I'd highly recommend writing the recipe you create down, even if, especially if you tweak it. Now the, the fun thing about making cocktails at home is that you're able to make it for guests when, whenever we're able to have guests at our home uh, again, or you're able to make it for your roommates or your family or the people who are over the age of 21. But yeah, so we'll get right to it. So this is our Knob Creek single barrel bourbon. Now bourbon is uh, America's native spirit, not only made in Kentucky, a good portion of the world's bourbon is made in Kentucky, but it has to be made in the United States. That's one of the rules. There are a few other rules. You can totally Wikipedia later. Um, we'll just get straight to the cocktail, but you can see I use two, uh, I'm sorry, one and a half ounces or three tablespoons if you're using that at home. Now this is uh, wasanbon sugar. Now wasanbon is a Japanese cane sugar. The flavor profile of the sugar um, and the reason we chose it, it has a very earthy flavor to it. Now, um, when I say earthy, somewhere along the lines of like a Demerara sugar, it's a little bit more like that brown sugar flavor. So this one, you're just gonna add half an ounce. All right, so we have our bourbon or our spirit. We have our sugar. We have our water with our ice and last is our bitters. Now, this little squeeze bottle uh, contains half an ounce of Angostura bitters. Now, Angostura bitters is a very classic aromatic bitter, and the easiest way to explain it would be like cocktail seasoning. So you're going to want to add it. Uh, you know, a, a little bit goes a long way. If you look up classic recipes of the old-fashioned, you're going to get like one dash, two dash. Um, here at Bar Apron, we use 10 dashes. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big amount. Now, the, the type of dasher we commonly use in the bar look like this, and the dashes come out, you know, one at a time. We'll go through and we'll do 10 of those. Um, but what we're going to use... What we're going to use here for this Lexus Lux Masterclass is a little squeeze bottle. Now, if you give it three nice squeezes, or I measured it out, 65 drops. But you'll probably be still measuring when we're done with the class. So I would just say three squeezes. We're going to go ahead and give it a stir. Now, stirring is solely to add water to the cocktail to help balance it out. The Knob Creek you're enjoying is 120 proof or 60% alcohol by volume. So very strong, yet very flavorful. So correct dilution is, is key. All right, so now that our cocktail's ready, I'm gonna get our glass. This is a double old fashioned glass. Here at the bar, we have everything measured out. So I think it's roughly a 10 ounce glass. And we have our ice mold that we've uh, chipped. You could have made this with the um, Lexus ice mold that came with your packet, but I, th I don't know if it would have frozen in time, but we're gonna go ahead and drop this into the glass. I'm like six months out of practice, so give me a break. And then we're gonna get a Hawthorne strainer. Now, if you were using a pint glass or something at home, what you could do is you could just use a spoon to kind of trap the ice and pour it over the, the uh, the cocktail glass. I'm going to use what's called a Hawthorne strainer. It has a little uh, metal strainer in there to kind of keep out all the ice and all of the thicker pieces. You can see the clarity in the ice here at the bar. The importance of this is on our bar, while people are enjoying these cocktails, we want them to enjoy it how we intended it to taste for as long as possible. So a very densely frozen ice cube melts much slower, therefore not altering the flavor too much. Everything Everything we did to create this cocktail, we wanted to stay that way with you as long as possible. But now we're going to get our orange peels, which were located in the garnish bags that you had. Now, I don't know if you can see this on the light, but when I squeeze this, you can see all those oils coming out. Now, that's exactly what we want to trap over the top of the cocktail. So I'm just going to express all the oils from our orange peel just over the top. Going to put it right over the top of there. Garnish it nice. I'm gonna set it down here. This is our BLA Old Fashioned. So I'm just gonna slide this to the side. 
Okay, so next, um, there was another ingredient on my left, and it's called Carpano Antica. Carpano Antica is a sweet vermouth, it's a fortified vermouth. Essentially, a fortified wine, I should say. Essentially, wine that they've added flavors to. Um, there's another classic cocktail, very well known, called the Manhattan. So I'm going to make a version of that cocktail. Um, classically, the Manhattan is made with rye whiskey, which is also a Native American spirit. Uh, but I'm going to do it with bourbon here for, for you. So same, same process. We're going to get our, our uh, mixing glass, or if you have it at home, your pint glass. This time a little different, though. We're going to take our glass. And what we want to do is we want to stage the ice in the glass. And the reason for that is we're going to spend all this time chilling this glass down and diluting it. We do not want to pour a cold cocktail into a warm glass. So now I'm just going to set this on the side here. We're going to build our um, cocktail here. So the, the recipe for a Manhattan a semi-classic Manhattan. It's kind of the thing that's fun about doing cocktails at home and putting your own twist on everything is that you can really, you know, if you enjoy bourbon more than rye, go ahead and use bourbon in a, in a Manhattan. Or if you enjoy rye more than bourbon, you go ahead and use rye in an old fashioned. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no one correct way to do it. It's like taste, it's subjective. So for the uh, Carpano Antica or Sweet Vermouth, I'm gonna go ahead and add one ounce to our mixing glass. I'm gonna take our bourbon. I'm going to add two ounces. So as you can see from the kit, you could probably make a few more Manhattans and you could probably make one more Manhattan or old fashioned. And lastly, we're gonna use that same aromatic bitters, which is an aromatic cocktail bitter called Angostura and three big squeezes in there or 65 dots. One, two, Three. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so I'm gonna put this down here. So we built the cocktail. I'm gonna get our ice. I'm just gonna drop the ice right in the glass. Now, when I was talking about tasting it before you put the ice, the reason is now I add the ice, I'm on the clock. There's water that's now being incorporated into the cocktail. So it's very important that you kind of get the, the proportions right before this part, because really you're just stirring to introduce water to help balance. Now, if you're using ice that's very melted or it's been sitting out for a while, what you're gonna get is more water quickly because it's gonna melt much faster. But if you're coming straight out of the freezer, you know, you can probably stir it a little bit more. I'm going to just empty. And I'm gonna pour our cocktail, the Bourbon Manhattan, a little variation, a classic old fashioned right into our chilled cocktail glass. And once again, the proportions were one ounce of Carpano Antica Sweet Vermouth, two ounces of whiskey of your choice, and three squeezes of that Angostura bitters. Now the lemon that was in your uh, kit, I put it in there for this reason. Now the lemon I like to use in the top of a Manhattan just to create a different type of aroma other than orange, but citrus, it's really bright, really and then the, the real depth and complexity of a Manhattan. So I'm just gonna express the oils right over the top. <clears throat> now the way you get these peels is, quickly show you. I'm just gonna set this Manhattan down. I did that a couple of times before. Anyway, so take the, lot, uh, take the lemon here, get a cutting board, which which you should have ready in a knife, and you're simply just gonna cut off a piece of the peel, a little wheel. Now the goal is not to get any of the fruit inside. You just want the outside, because all you want to uh, capture is those oils, and then you're just gonna express the oils just over the top of the cocktail. You can see all those oils coming out, creating that nice aroma. So there we have a, a, a little Manhattan variation. All right, so, um, those two, two are some of my favorite whiskey cocktails. They're staples here at Bar Leather Apron. And the, uh, the, uh, the fun thing about it, you know, here we, we curate every ingredient and we choose the ingredients that we think fit best into the uh, flavor profile for these cocktails. But at home, you know, if, kind of have fun with it. 
take separate ingredients, you know, different ingredients, different styles, different whiskeys. You can substitute rum for, for whiskey in an old fashion. You can substitute tequila, you know, and there's, there was a time where cocktails, it was very hard to find information on it, but literally you're just typing your, your uh, website away from getting thousands of different recipes. So, all right, so moving on, we're gonna go a little bit into a, to a classic cocktail called the daiquiri. I'm sure all of you heard of it. I'm not talking about the daiquiri that comes in a five foot glass that you wear in a lanyard in Las Vegas. I'm talking about a, a classic daiquiri, um, which uh, arguably creative, created in a few different places. I'm not gonna get too much into that because I have my beliefs, but other people believe other ways. But I am gonna talk about the beautiful rum that we're gonna use in the daiquiri as the base of the daiquiri. So this is called Kohana. And Kohana is a rum made here on Oahu in Kunia, uh, the central Oahu area. Um, and it's a style of rum called Agricole. Now, I know you're thinking how all rum is rum, but it's, it's a little different. All rum is derived, is a deriv derivative of sugarcane. Um, except Kohana is going to be um, fresh sugarcane juice as opposed to molasses. Now, 95% of the world's rum is made from molasses, but Kohana is made from taking fresh sugarcane juice and fermenting and distill from that point. Um, the, the, uh, the difference between the two rums is all in the flavor. Uh, Agricole style rums, classically from Martinique, or in this case, Kunia, uh, have a very earthy flavor profile and you're gonna get the true flavor of the cane and therefore like a very unique flavor. Even the aroma of it is very distinct. If you have the kit, just go ahead and open it up and give that a smell. It's gonna be something like, like you've never smelt before, but <clears throat> let me set that on the side here. So this one is a little bit more prep work um, as you're gonna to have to juice the limes that come with the kit. So we're gonna start off with that. If you have a hand press, that works great. If not, you can use some Cool contraption, like I don't even know what this is called, but it's awesome, this thing, juicer. Or you can do uh, what I have to do a lot of times on the fly because I go to family parties and everyone's like, oh, you know how to make cocktails, make us cocktails. So I'll show you all three ways. I'm gonna cut these limes up. Now, a lime should yield about half an ounce, uh, roughly, roughly a little bit more. So therefore we included three limes so you can make roughly two to three cocktails with the, with the, uh, the things that the kit supplies. So this guy, I'm just gonna push in and juice. Sorry to call him this guy, I just don't have a name. I don't know what it's actually called. Old school juicer. So two of the limes I'm gonna do this way. And you can see the amount of juice that that helped yield. So a pretty good amount, just over an ounce. And then next you have the hand presser, which I, I don't have here, but, and then the third way, which is what I do usually on the fly at barbecues or whenever my father asks me to make cocktails at his house without letting me know ahead of time, is you just splice the lime, just making an X in the middle, and then you just give it a little squeeze. And you can see it all coming out from the, the bottom part of the lime. Anyway, that's how we're gonna make our lime. Get this cleaned up and out of the way. Okay, so moving on to the next tool that we will need. Um, this is called a three-piece shaker or a cobbler shaker. Many people call it. And the top, there is a, uh, a built-in strainer. So it's, it's great, it has everything. It has, it has uh, everything you need. And you can go straight into the glass after this. Now with a, uh, with, at home, though, there's a few things you could use, and we've included it in the, uh, in the list of uh, items if you're procuring it other ways in the kit. But you could use Tupperware. This is a little deli container. This works fine. Um, you could use a hydro flask. That works fine. Anything that's going to not explode while you're shaking it and can hold ice and liquid and can be shaked to create um, dilution and to, create, to chill the cocktail down a little bit. So I'm going to slowly build this cocktail and talk about the ingredients. So first up, we're gonna use some of that fresh lime juice that we've squeezed. Now the classic recipe for a daiquiri, which I like to use here at Barlet Apron, is two parts spirit rum, 
three quarter part citrus and half part sugar. So I just added three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. I'm gonna use a little sugar syrup here. So simple syrup, which you have in your kit, or you can make it home very easily. Essentially sugar and water, equal parts. So if you're gonna take one liter of water, I mean, you probably don't need much at home, but one liter of water, that's how we do it at the bar. And then one liter of hot water, we add one, and then we add, we have a two liter container, we fill it up one liter with hot water, and then we add the sugar and bring it to the two liter mark and slowly mix it in. Uh, with a spoon. There's no need to leave it on the stove. There's going to be too much evaporation and it's, it's going to thicken and be a little too sweet. So you just want to stir it till that hot water breaks down that sugar. So we're going to add half an ounce of our sugar syrup, one to one we call it. And last we have uh, Kohana. So Kohana, if you look at the bottle, you know, on each bottle I included the name and um, any really important information like the, the proof. So this is 40% ABV or 80 proof. And in, in this case, Kohana Papa'a, which is the varietal of sugarcane used to make this rum. Now the cool thing the guys at Kohana, the guys and gals at Kohana did was take indigenous strains of sugarcane that the native Hawaiians brought with them here to the islands, they call it canoe cane, regrew it and make single varietal rum from those sugar canes. So, you know, every one is slightly different um, but uh, the, the, the whole thing behind it is you're getting the natural flavor of the cane. So it's, it's, it's wonderful and aroma. So if you've had the kit and you smell it, you know what I'm talking about. And you're going to add two ounces of Kohana. So being a six ounce bottle, roughly three cocktails in there. Okay, now I didn't add any ice yet. So what I want to do is I want to go a little bit into uh, what we have in our garnish bag here. There's two, this section, these two top ones. We have our dehydrated lime wheels that we've seasoned with Angostura bitters, which is a classic aromatic cocktail bitter. We season it first and we dehydrate it. And what essentially happens is we pull all the, the, liqu the, the liquid out of the lime, but we're creating like almost like a tea using that Angostura bitters. So as when I garnish the cocktail, you'll see, but as it sits, it's gonna slowly impart a nice little flavor into the cocktail. And then we have a little sugar cane here. Uh, the sugar cane is gonna be holding the lime. Um, if you wanna open that up, I'll give you a, a little bit to kind of create it. So each sugar cane is sliced for you already. You're just gonna take our dehydrated lime wheel and slide it in just like so. And just prep that and hold it right on the side. So once again, we're gonna get our glass. This is a little different, but actually the, the, the Manhattan we made a little earlier and this glass, I, I know the, uh, the amounts of all of our, this is four ounces. So if shaken properly, if built properly, it should fill out right to the rim for the, the daiquiri. And just like the Manhattan, what we're gonna do is we're gonna chill it down. So I'm gonna take a little ice, put it into the glass. If you do have any questions, feel free to hit that questions box and we can get to it a little later. But like I said, um, if, you, if you feel like you want to add a little bit more rum after you make it to help balance it to your flavor profile, definitely write that down. So when you have guests in the future, it's something to reference and you can just go ahead and you can, you can feel confident like this is a great cocktail, you know, and you, you know it because you already have the recipe. All right. So I'll get that ice one more time. Fill it up here. Now this is a this is a type of shaker used in Japan a lot. It's where I learned how to use it and where what inspired me. A lot of the inspiration from Barlow the Apron, to be honest, comes from Japan. Just the attention to detail. But the the way I'm going to shake this shaker, I'm going to be moving back and forward. A lot of people call it the hard shake, but essentially what I'm trying to do is create a circular motion, allowing the liquid to rotate around the ice as opposed to a back and forward motion which will allow the ice to crack and break. So you can see. We speed it up. And if in your list, you should have a micro, sh a little uh, fine strainer. And the reason we're using a fine strainer is we want to catch all the little ice shards that may have came off of the ice blocks. 
while we're shaking, as well as any of the finer pulps from the citrus. So you can see that beautiful color, also the beautiful aroma. Now we're just gonna take our sugar cane and our dehydrated lime wheel and place it right over the top. And now I'm just gonna set it down. This is a Kohana daiquiri. One of my favorite classic cocktails, nice and refreshing. Set it right here. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do is really like go and delve into the, the possibilities that you have at your own home of using your own ingredients from your pantry or from your garden. Something we spoke about was really important for us because it really allows you to showcase your own creativity in the cocktails. And I'm really gonna, and I'm gonna do it in something like this, like a little Tupperware. So I'll do it how you might be doing it at home. So think about some of your favorite combinations of flavors. For me, um, blackberries, I love blackberries. I love sage. Um, I love blood orange. And you know, all of those things work really well in the cocktail. So when you think about what we've made, whether it's sweetener, whether it's citrus, just think about how you can replace lime. Maybe I can use calamansi, you know, maybe I can use blood orange and use those same proportions and see what happens. What I'm going to do is do one that's a little bit more involved. So I'm going to start off with a little fresh sage. <clears throat> I'm just going to pick a little sage. This came from my, uh, my garden I have at Kahala Mall called Whole Foods. Just kidding. But yeah, sage is a great addition to any cocktail, um, especially when you're using things, very aromatic element, like uh, blackberries, which I'm also gonna use. And put four in there. Now what I wanna do is I wanna add a little bit of my Kohana. So that same amount, about two ounces. Now, in, in a cocktail bar, in a bar, at this point, a muddler would come in handy where you're crushing everything, getting everything really incorporated. I'm gonna show you something that, you may not have a muddler at home, but I'm pretty sure you have a spoon. So a spoon works fine. I'm just gonna crush everything and mix it together. You can see the beautiful color starting to incorporate with the blackberries. And the sage. Now, I'm gonna take that, strut, I'm gonna try it. And at this point you can see, okay, maybe I need a little bit more blackberry influence, maybe a little bit more sage. I think a little more sage would do well in this cocktail. So I'm gonna add that. The sage is very aromatic. It's hard to convey through the camera, but it smells very good. Okay, so I have everything nicely incorporated. Now we're going to add the rest of our ingredients. So I have that sugar syrup or half an ounce, one to one. And lastly, we're going to squeeze a little bit more lime juice. I'm getting wild over here. It's best to have all your ingredients procured and create your mise, or mise en place, which is all the things you need to execute what you're trying to do so you're not running around. Just imagine you're on a camera in front of hundreds of people making the cocktail. No, don't do that. Just kidding. All right, we're gonna add a jigger, and I'm gonna measure out three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. All right. That's gonna go straight into our Tupperware or whatever it is you're using. Now I'm gonna take this opportunity before I add water to try. Great, I get everything, I get sage, I get blackberry. There's some acidity from the lime and some sweetness from the sugar. We're just gonna take a little bit of ice. Now, depending on the size of the container you're using, you wanna leave some room for the ice to be able to move around because that movement and the shaking is what's gonna help impart dilution. Set that on the side. We're gonna get our, our glass. I'm also gonna ice that down. The 
this is definitely a step you can do beforehand. Or if you pull it out of the fridge, that works great too. Set that on the side. Truth be told, I've never actually shaken a cocktail in this deli style container. So we're doing it together as a first. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little back and forth. You really just want to incorporate the liquid with the ice and help a little dilution. Let me get rid of the water in our cocktail glass. And I'm carefully gonna pour the contents into our chilled glass. Okay, so this is totally on the fly. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a little blackberry. I'm gonna give it a little slice. I'm gonna take a chopstick. I'm gonna poke a hole in the top. I'm gonna to pick. A, I'm gonna to try to pick a nice little sage leaf. I'm gonna stuff it in there so it looks. And just place it on the glass. So there you have a little garnish to impress your friends. A little blackberry sage kohana daiquiri. Set this on the side here. Now, hopefully you're taking pictures as you're going through and sending them over. I'd love to see all the uh, variations and all the cocktails you're doing. Um, of, co of course, you can't see this part. There's a big mess down here, but we're very happy to welcome you to our bar once we're able to again, and um, we'll do the dishes for you. But yeah, this is, this is kind of a fun little, inter uh, little class we put together, something on the fly something classic, you know, and something a little bit altered uh, with some of the ingredients. Just, just to show, goes to show like we just have these five bottles here, but we could make many, many, many cocktails with it. So <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a fun thing to do. And if you ever have any questions or concerns or ideas, we'd love to hear them at, at the bar. So come on down and check us out. Um, I think, uh, I think that's, that's about it as far as uh, cocktails go. Now, the, let's see here, Kohana, um, one thing, so you, you can get many of these whiskeys if you want to get full size bottles of them. You, you wouldn't be able to get uh, the Knob Creek single barrel bourbon, uh, BLA's signature, because we, we're only allowed to pour it here. It's not sold in stores, but Kohana, uh, Kohana Distillery is located in Kunia. Check them out. Um, yeah, but thank you so much. It's been, a, oh, it's been a pleasure making cocktails with you today, and I hope uh, all of you have a safe and great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, hello again, this is Casey's voice that you hear. Um, I'm off camera just so we can ensure uh, some proper social distancing. Um, just, I think um, some people, um, you clearly are the master um, and some people did have a little bit of difficulty. <laughs> Thank you, keeping, Casey's voice. Uh, keeping up, so, but, but I guess before we get to that, because some folks did finish their drinks and I think one question that they're asking um, and Dave in particular asked was, what do you do with the garnishes? Do you eat the lime, put the lime in the drink? Um, mm. What do you recommend? Yeah. So. Everything that we garnish today here is edible. The orange peel, the blackberry, the sage, uh, maybe not as enjoyable as the next, but it's for a few reasons we garnish. Uh, for the eyes, because it's the first thing you see. Um, for the nose, because it's gonna help add aroma, as in the case of the uh, citrus oil. And for the taste, because the blackberry would go delicious with the blackberry that's already mixed into the cocktail. So I don't think there's any one, one way to do it. If you're doing it at home, if I were to recommend a way, maybe something that they could eat to enjoy with the cocktail, as opposed to m more of a strictly visual element. Um, but it's always nice to create something beautiful for your guests or, or for, for yourself, for yourselves. But I think, I think. So maybe uh, if we could go back to the Manhattan, would you sure. mind going over the ingredients and, and just maybe the steps one more time? Yep. Um, just a Definitely. little slower. A little slower. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really, I'm like, I have, a, I have multiple speeds here at the bar, but when I'm making a cocktail, I'm getting into it. My mind is all over the place. I'm thinking about the next drink and the next person. So sorry about the little, little speed there. But yeah, so the Manhattan is a classic whiskey-based whiskey cocktail, um, a bit more spirit forward, kind of in the same realm as an old fashioned, except you're not using uh, sugar to sweeten, you're using vermouth to sweeten. So it's gonna be a slightly uh, less sweet version of an old fashioned. 
if you want to put it that way. Classically made with rye whiskey. Now, when you think about rye whiskey to bourbon, the big difference, well, there's many differences, but the biggest difference is what it's made of. Bourbon is majority corn and rye is majority rye. So when you think about bread, cornbread and rye bread, rye has a lot of, as a grain, has more spicy notes. So the whiskey would naturally be more spicy. Corn is a bit sweeter, so bourbon would be a bit more sweet. So the Manhattan meat we made here, we used the base was bourbon, and it's going to be two ounces of bourbon. You're going to use one ounce of vermouth of any, any type. Sweet, there's sweet, there's dry, there's blanc, there's so many. Uh, in this case, we use a sweet vermouth. And then you're going to use roughly 10 dashes from a dasher, 65 drops from this, or three squeezes. So um, I think if I were going to give you some tips and you're making it based on that recipe, um, the one thing that I would alter would be the amount of bitters. I would put more. I'm a big fan of this, and I look at it as cocktail seasoning. So as long as you have a great whiskey, as long as you have a great vermouth, and those ratios and proportions are correct, um, the bitters is really going to set it off. So, and then the addition of the uh, fresh lemon oil over the top of the cocktail really gives that nice aroma pre-sip. So you're really setting it up before they actually, before I say they because I always talk about our guests, but before the person enjoying it takes a sip. So Justin, what is, um, Chris is asking, what is a good substitute for the Kohana rum? Chris, there's no good substitute for Kohana rum. It's local, buy it. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, well, it, it's kind of like just the same thing as the world of whiskey. The, it just depends on your palate. Now, um, taste is subjective. So what I taste isn't necessarily what you taste. So I enjoy this type of rum. Um, Chris, if you have, or Chris and the viewers, if you have the kit, you can see how different the flavor profile of this rum is to something that, something like Bacardi or something that more, you know, more mainstream or more um, a larger brands. But it just really depends on flavor profile. Aged rum, which means rum that's spent time in a barrel, just like whiskey, is a good, op a good option. Um, but there's really, there's really, I, I would say for a classic, okay. So on our menu, the only daiquiri we offer is a Kohana daiquiri. And we occasionally do a seasonal fruit to, to add to it. Um, it's because we really enjoy the flavor profile. Beyond the fact that it's local, beyond the fact that, that I can visit the distillery, it's just a great product. Um, but that being said, there's many great rums. So to say what can be the best substitute is like saying, I say, I don't know. I, I don't know what the, to, just your flavor profile would be the best substitute. But try Kohana first. Uh, speaking of, of other alternatives, um, so what is the, the Wasserman sugar for? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and how is it different from normal supermarket sugar? Right. Well, it depends what supermarket you're at, really. But so Wasserman sugar, I, I kind of mentioned earlier that the flavor profile of Wasserman is like taking a really earthy Demerara sugar. Now, when you, the, the sugar itself, if you taste it, You'll see it has a little bit more of a demerara or like a brown sugar flavor profile. But the real reason we chose it is how it interacted with the whiskey in, in, the, in the BLA old fashion specifically. So the difference between this sugar and say like a granulated white sugar would be, I guess, the type of sweetness. Um, rather than that cloying, just like sugar sweet, actually that's what, what this is here, just white sugar and water. You're going to get sweetness, but you also get a little earthiness to it. So when I say earthiness, I mean like flavors of like oak almost, flavors of like vanilla, um, which are two really common flavor profiles found in bourbon. So the fact that we're using that to pair with, with the bourbon whiskey, the Knob Creek single barrel, it was just like a match made in heaven. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, if you, Wasanbon is a Japanese cane sugar that we source from Japan. It is available here locally, I believe, at like a uh, Madokai or some of the Japanese um, supermarkets, but it's, it's fairly expensive. Um, and a little bit is, I, I can't, don't quote me on this, but a, a small packet about this big is about $20. And you're only going to get probably less than this if you cut it with equal parts of water. Um, here at the bar, we have a slightly different, um, uh, I guess, recipe to make it. It's not equal parts sugar and water. It's a little different. And if you want to hear that, I'll give you a job application. Just come down when we open up and I'll share all our secrets with you. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, so just try, try messing with the amount of sugar to water. 
because really that's what's going to create the, the balance and the sweetness compared to the other ingredients. So Justin, our, our first masterclass instructor, Chuck Faria, has a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. is, it, is it traditional to add a splash of soda to an old fashioned or just a preference? Hmm. Well, to answer you directly, Chuck, some people like it. It's a little inside joke. No, but you know what? That's, that's kind of, I kind of touched on that a little bit as I was going through it. It's, and it, there's no correct way to do, there's no right or wrong way to do one thing. It's like saying, this is the best wine. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's subjective, right? So there's hundreds of maybe thousands of different ways of making a, an old fashioned. It depends how far you want to go back, you know? So as you go back in time, and what I like to say to our guests is it's a bit more cut and dry as you go back because you didn't have the options as far as rest, uh, ingredients. So I would say adding a splash of, some places add uh, an old, a classic old fashioned made with brandy and they add Sprite to it. You know, um, so I've had versions of an old fashioned with soda water. And because I'm a purist as far as the flavor profile of bourbon, I tend to not enjoy that as much as the way I made it here. But Chuck, if you're making it, it's probably be really good. So let us know. Um, we have a few questions around uh, bitters and you know, what, is, what brand of bitters do you recommend? Um, and what other bitters do you like in your old fashioned um, and Manhattan? So um, bitter, okay, bitters, this is an interesting topic. So 10 years ago, or 12 years ago, when I started really delving into the world of cocktails, bitters wasn't as much of a thing. Um, you couldn't find every flavor of bitters under the sun like you can now. Now there's literally a hundred different versions of orange bitters, you know, but I, I tend to stick to the classic and the classic styles of, of bitters. Um, now what bitters is essentially is a neutral grain spirit or very high proof alcohol that they soak things in. So it's a, a maceration of flavors. Um, the one that we have here in this little dropper is called Angostura. I'm, I'm working on getting a bottle to show you. Um, is very classic and it's, it's what we use the most of here in the bar. Um, yeah, it's kind of like one of those questions like what's the best whiskey? It's, it's hard to tell, um, but I can tell you exactly what we use. We use, the, we use two types of bitters for cocktails um, on our, our signature menu and many, many other types for the cocktails that we rotate. Um, Angostura, it's a, I don't have a bottle with me now, but it's a yellow cap, oversized label. You've probably seen it in every bar like old bars and it's an ingredient that never gets used in the back bar, but that's aromatic bitters. Um, orange bitters as well is very popular in both classic cocktails and cocktails we do here. For our orange bitters, I actually use three different brands of orange bitters and I mix them together. And each bitter is, I, I chose to use for the flavor profile. One of them is called Fee Brothers, which is, is pretty commercially available and it's, their orange bitters is, is a little sweet so I like to use it for that reason. Another would be um, the Bitter Truth, which is a very common brand of, of bitters. They make many different flavors, orange being one of their main. I use that. And I also use a bergamot orange bitter. So bergamot is a very, a very like bitter um, varietal of orange. And it's from a company in Los Angeles uh, called Miracle Mile. And I mix those together to do our house orange bitters. So that just goes to show I use one bottle for this and I use three for our other. So. There's so many different types of bitters out there. Um, but if I were going to rec recommend just one bitter to have at your house, it would be Angostura, it, the most classic. So just thinking on, on, on I guess, the viewer's right side um, and talking a little bit more about those drinks, um, mm -hmm. is it better to use uh, a crushed sugar cube or simple syrup liquid for an old fashioned? Good question. And it's a question we get very often because when you look in cocktail books, you're going to get the classic old fashioned sugar cube bitters muddled and you build the cocktail, sometimes muddling fruit, sometimes putting soda water. Um, the reason we chose not to go that route for our BLA old fashioned is because the final sip of cocktails that use a sugar cube cube, if not done correctly, is a grainy sugar taste. And when you're talking about the last sip of the cocktail, it's, it's what you're leaving you're left off with. So we wanted to, to, be just as good as the first. So we do the dilution of the wasan bone or we mix down the, sh the simple syrup in the daiquiri um, just for consistency purposes. But yeah, I think it's, it's a fun thing to do though when you do the, the sugar cube um, and muddling fruit, you know, add, adding other things like lily koi works well with whiskey. Um, 
We even do a cocktail here, uh, Japanese whiskey based with shiso leaves. So it, it's, it's really like endless. But as far as the sugar goes, I stick to the pre or the, the already mixed sugar for consistency purposes. And just going to the basics um, on the old fashioned, do you mind just going over really quickly again, the measurements for the old fashioned? Sure, definitely. And, and this is this old fashioned we made is the exact old fashioned that we make in the bar. Um, it's probably going to be nothing like any other old fashioned you find in any recipe book or online. It's a, uh, it's one and a half ounces of our Knob Creek single barrel bourbon, which looks like this. And you, you, you think about the Manhattan, you think about this, it, it's just the amount of, um, uh, how the ingredients play off of each other. So this is 120 proof. So it's a lot of, it's, it's a big proof, high, high strength, um, high alcohol content, but definitely flavorful. So it's an ounce and a half of this. The wasan bone sugar is half an ounce and the bitters, if you're using it from, from this thing is three squeezes. Now this, this little tool that I brought out earlier, this is a dasher. It's available online. If you are going to create a bar at home, I would highly recommend picking up something like this, a bitters dasher. The reason being the dash, as you can see when I do it, is very consistent, it stops. Now that is different when you buy the bottle of bitters, say this was the bitter. If the bottle is half full and you're bit doing a dash, you're getting all this momentum from the liquid coming down and the dashes are a bit more inconsistent. So highly recommend this if, it's, if cocktails is something you do at your house often. Um, but yeah, th or this works, just fill this and do three squeezes or 65 drops. So I'll go over it again. One and a half ounces of bourbon, uh. half an ounce of um, sugar sweetener or wasan bone in this case. You could swap this out and that would work fine too. So if you run out of this, go ahead for that. Uh, and then bitters. Uh, we use 10 dashes of bitters. Now, I think that answers that question. On the wasambo and sugar, where mm -hmm. can you buy it? You can, can't buy it. You got to come here. Sorry. Good. No, you, well, you, okay. So if you want, you, I don't know somewhere locally you can buy it, but what I can tell you, if you want to, so say you don't want to do a, a straight sugar water ratio, uh, white sugar, granulated sugar and water. What you can buy is Demerara sugar. It's a type of sugar. It's similar to brown sugar, but I would, I would, I would go for Demerara specifically. And if I were going to, the sweetness in Demerara is a little different. I wouldn't go equal parts water to, to sugar. If I was uh, turning it into a liquid, I would go slightly more sugar to water. So maybe uh, we do it in grams. So I couldn't, uh, what's the translation? Just do three parts, three parts sugar, two and a half parts water, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, less, less water to sugar. So it's more sweet in theory, but you can try it and always add more. You know, it's, it's kind of the beauty of doing it at home and in the comfort of your own home. You're not on a camera where you can mess up and everyone's going to tease you later. So. And I think you mentioned this earlier when you're going through it, uh, but for simple sugar, you're mentioning doing it on hot water, not on heat because of the evaporation. Is that yes, correct? Yes. So that was something I learned early on, you know, like there was a time where like, Cocktail bars were considered people who make their own syrups and use fresh juice, which I think all bars should use because why not use the freshest ingredients? So when I would make simple syrup, I'd put a pot on the stove with water, bring it to a boil, add the sugar and stir it until I couldn't see the sugar anymore. But what I started to realize is there was a lot of inconsistency as far as texture because it's a big, it, it plays a big role as far as texture goes in the cocktail and the sweetness levels are so high. So if you were to put uh, equal parts, weight of water and sugar into a, a pot and put it on heat and bring it to a boil. The steam you see coming off is, is lick, um, evaporation happening. If the, the, the syrup in the pot is thickening, it's like you're shortening it. Right? So what I do is I heat up the water and in a, in a separate container, I'll add one liter of water. I'll have a liter mark, a liter mark. I'll add the water and then I'll add the sugar to the two liters. So it's exactly equal proportion. And I just stir it until everything's diluted. Um, if you have a sous vide system, it works really well, stir it and then set it in the sous vide, which is like a, a water vacuum or a water oven. Um, and you can slowly melt that without getting any evaporation or thickening to the, to the sugar syrup. So we have a question about ice, which I think we were expecting to get at mm -hmm. some point is <laughs> how do you make ice clear? And is it different than the ice you would take out of a freezer? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Good question. Good question with an extremely long answer, but I'm going to give you the, the most direct answer. How, how do you make ice is you put water in the freezer, but the, the reason you make clear, the reason we use clear ice here at leather apron is, is it melts slower. So if you, if you look at this old fashioned, I'll put it over here. Like we made this uh, almost an hour ago. And if I pull this little ball out, there's still a good shape to this ice ball. Now, if you're not finishing your drink in an hour, come here. Don't, don't make them at home anymore. Come here, but <laughs> no, no, no. So, so clear ice. The idea with clear ice is we want to take a, you know what? I'm going to do what I do here at the bar for our guests when they ask the same question. And I'm going to show you, but give me one second. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I'll show you exactly what I do. So we take a, okay, imagine a container, okay? This is your ice mold. And you fill it with water and you put it into the freezer. Cold air is gonna be hitting every angle of that container. Now what happens is it freezes from the outside in. And slowly but surely all the heavier minerals and air is trapped in the center of that ice mold. So you have that, that cloudiness in the middle. So take that same ice mold, you getting this? and you insulate it or use a little igloo cooler, right? And now fill it with water, put it in the freezer. Cold air isn't hitting any other parts except the top. So if you imagine how a lake freezes, it freezes from the top down because the earth works as insulation. So it's gonna freeze top down and essentially pushing all the air and uh, heavier minerals to the bottom of the container. That's where you're gonna get a lot of cloudiness. But right here, you're gonna get a, a nice clear mold. So we take this, or a nice clear block. So we take this section, we break it up, and then we chip it by hand into the shapes that fit in the glass. Now, how do you make it? Um, there's a lot of things you can read online using distilled water, using uh, filtered water. Those things are all important as far as the flavor and waters and, and less minerals, but less minerals tends to yield a, a more densely frozen ice cube. So um, it, the easy way to, to tell you how to do it at home is put a little cooler in the water. And uh, do we have time to chip one. I can chip one real quick. Yeah. You guys are cool down with that. So this is essentially this piece here, this clear piece is what I just drew right here. Now, how we make this is this is about one, this is about one eighth of the size of the container we freeze. But on the bottom, if you can really look, you can see, You can see there's some bubbles trapped in here. So what I'm gonna do now is take a tool like this. It's a, it's a three prong ice pick and I'm gonna chip it into the shape that's gonna eventually go into this glass. So I'll do that real quick. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna do it down here for the sake of uh, everyone in the splash zone here, but I'll go, it, it just takes about a minute or two to, to slowly shape the ice. So this is stuff that we do during prep. I don't know if I got away from the actual question, but pretty sure. So you can see it slowly taking shape. Now the, this three pre, this three prong tool, we use the prong, like the spikes to break the big pieces and this little lip here to kind of get the detail stuff. So I'm gonna try to knock this out quick and, and chip it into the rough shape, what will eventually be the ice ball. We're gonna set this here. You can see that thing's got uh, a little uh, shape there. So this is just a little uh, Cambro container or you can use anything, uh, any container that holds water, a little warm water here. Pardon us for doing this on the fly. So I'm just gonna set this down. I'm gonna give this a little bit more chip just to kind of But the whole reason for doing this, other than the fact that this is really cool and it looks right, it's, it's very visually appealing, is the fact that when we build our cocktail, we know that it will stay on that ice block and it will remain the flavor we intended it to be. So, you can tell I'm out of work because I'm out of breath from just chipping this freaking ice. Okay, 
So this is a microfiber cloth, very similar to what you use to polish a, a wine glass. <clears throat> I'm going to get the same glass that that old fashioned is. I'm going to set it here. I'm going to wrap this in the cloth kind of like a, a hammock. And now the, the act of doing this is going to shape that ice ball to that glass. And every once in a while, I'm going to dip it in the water so you can see. So you hear that cracking. I actually didn't temper it long enough. So it's, it's not going to be totally clear, but you'll get the whole idea of what I mean. So you remember what it looked like in the beginning. And just after a few seconds, of, you can see it slowly taking shape and smoothing out. This was totally on the fly based on that question. So we didn't have it, it, it set up right away. But thank you for asking it because we love doing this. So you can see the taking shape. Now, th this part's a little cracked because we didn't allow it to temper or sit out long enough. But you can see the clarity in the ice here. Now, my lovely assistant, Paul, gave me cold water to roll this ice in. Therefore, it's going to take a little longer. But how about the next question while I finish? And I think, you know, if anybody is watching that has not been to Bar Leather Apron before, this is <laughs> definitely part of the appeal of mm. coming to the bar. It's, it's more than just cocktails. It's definitely an experience to come and enjoy a drink here. For sure. Um, so definitely do so when they reopen. I think it's important to note that anywhere you go, whether it be a restaurant, whether it be here at Bar Leather Apron, it should be much beyond the contents of the glass or the items on the plate. It's more so about the whole experience, you know, from the moment you walk in to when you leave and everything in between. So... These things I do here, we do them before we open to help with that. So you can see now that the shape of this ice is a little bit higher than the glass at this point, but a little bit more rolling. We'll get it to that. Now, this is what we do during prep, prep work. So we come in here a few hours each day before we actually open and get all of this stuff done. Um, the whole point is it's like, it's like just like we are at home when you're creating your mise or your setup, so you don't have to leave the area to get it. So everything's ready for us once we open our doors for our guests. And when they come in, it's almost like a, a easy for them to enjoy. So I think I got it to the right shape. So you can see it just above the tip of the glass. I mean, don't mind the cracking. It's just because we put it in the water too quick, which is what happens with ice. But yeah, so that you can see it. That's basically how we do it. Any other questions? Definitely. Um, I, I just want to note that we are at the, the one hour mark, but we're going to just keep going for a little bit yeah. because I definitely want to, we didn't even get to the, the left side of the frame and talking a little bit about the perfect. daiquiri. Yeah, so perfect. if people watching our um, game, then, you know, please continue to stay on and we'll, we'll kind of jump into a little bit more questions. Um, so just maybe just to start kind of similar questions on the right side is, could you just go over one more time the, the measurements for uh, the daiquiri? This side. Okay, sure. So the classic daiquiri, um, two ounces of spirit or Kohana rum in our case, three quarters of an ounce of citrus or fresh lime juice in our case, and half an ounce of sweetener or uh, one to one simple syrup in this case. Now I say ha a sweetener because I could have easily swapped out honey for this simple syrup and it would create a different flavor profile. Um, I could have easily swapped out a different rum, which I would never do. I could have easily swapped out a different citrus, which I tend to do or add a, a a element of citrus like calamansi, which I really enjoy, or lily koi. So yeah, two, three quarter, half. Rum, citrus, sugar. So that's that's the classic, my favorite version of a classic daiquiri. And then when we talk about mixing or uh, the mixer, it, does the material matter whether it's metal or plastic or you know, is there a preference? I mean, the, the 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 technical answer is yes, of course. The easy answer is as long as you're using um, as long as you're familiar with the type of ice you're using to add dilution, because now I, I talked about the three ingredients and the recipe, water is the other ingredient and it's very important. So if you're using ice that's very like frozen, then a little bit longer shake um, really helps balance the cocktail. It, it, it's almost irrelevant what style of, of a, a vessel you're using to shake it. But so for instance, for here, just because we're on the topic of, uh, of ice and shaking. Um, when we shake the cocktail, what we want to do is we want to chill it down and we want to properly dilute it. We don't want to over dilute it. So if we were using, I'm going to do two shakers here. I'm going to show you, give you a little example, something we do at the bar a lot 
<clears throat> I'm going to fill them with ice. This is the same ice. Well, it's different ice, but it's the same ice. <laughs> And maybe while you're doing that, Justin, yeah. sorry to interrupt, is just talking, one of the questions was about size of the ice as well. Yeah, size matters. <laughs> uh, not really. Yeah, sort of, yes. Actually, it does matter, but what matters more is how frozen it is. Now, if, like, here at Leather Apron, I know you can't see this, but right here we have a two-drawer freezer. And when we make our cocktails, all the ice comes out of the freezer as we make it. So we're always starting from the same point. Now, if all of our ice was in a conventional ice well, which is right in front of me here, it's melting. So as I add a scoop of ice, you're adding a little bit of water because it's already melting. So that it matters in that sense. Um, the larger ice in the glass. So I, we chip the, we chip the ice to fit the glass so that we know the amount, exact amount of liquid we're putting into there so that it comes to the, to the top of the cocktail glass and it, the ice doesn't move around a lot. Ice moving around a lot is going to cause dilution. Dilution is going to cause um, the flavor profile to kind of, weekend. So it matters, of course. Yeah. So um, take two shakers, same shakers. And I'm going to do this example with the same shakers. But now imagine if you're using something, a larger glass or a larger uh, shaker uh, element or something like that. So I'm going to cap them off. I'm going to shake them with no liquid in it. So first I'm going to shake it the style I did where I'm rotating the liquid around the ice. I'm going to shake it for the same amount of time. So I'm moving it this way. Now I'm going to shake it just straight up and down. It's going to be a little loud. So sorry. You can already hear You probably already know what I'm going to show you after this. So if I'm just shaking it that way, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour both of these containers out. What you're going to see is you're going to see all these shards of ice. This eventually turns to water, which eventually over dilutes your cocktail. This, this is just chilling your cocktail with the proper dilution. So when it comes to ice and how you shake it or how you impart the, the ice or the dilution in the cocktail, it's definitely big time for sure. Anything else? Yeah, so um, a more general question is, um, you know, for people at home thinking about, you know, having a home bar, mm -hmm. what are your recommendations for essential spirits that they should have, you know, reliable, economical labels? Sure. Um, okay, so I, I get asked this question fairly often about home bars. You know, it, it, it really depends on what you enjoy. If you're not a fan of tequila, I wouldn't recommend getting a tequila. But if you're a fan of classic cocktails, then I would probably list two or three of your favorite classics and different styles of spirits and you start there. So I enjoy, for instance, I enjoy old fashions. So I immediately know my back bar, I would need whiskey, bourbon of some sort that I enjoy. Um, I'll need aromatic bitters. You know, I'll have to prep some simple syrup, which you can make ahead of time and leave in the fridge. Um, and I also like Manhattans. So just like I showed you today, I just get a little, little sweet vermouth and I already have two, two classics right there. Just getting uh, three ingredients. Um, I like, I also really enjoy uh, the margarita, which is classic. So I'll buy a tequila that I enjoy the flavor profile of. And I already have sugar because it's a part of my old fashioned makeup. And I'll buy some sort of citrus. So that's just a bottle of tequila. Um, and if you like, if you're a fan of gin, say I like the a Collins or um, it's another cocktail of people. Uh, like a gin and tonic. Well, I mean, yeah, gin and tonic. So gin, I would buy a gin that I enjoy the flavor profile. Now with gin, it's really about the botanicals that drive the flavor profile. And it goes back to what I said earlier about the further you go back in time, the more cut and dry it was. Now you're gonna find gins that use dried yuzu peels, uh, sencha tea, all different types of, of, of things where at one point gin was driven on the flavor of juniper, which is like a piney note. But there's so many different types of gins. So find one you enjoy. You know, make a gin old fashioned, make a, make a, uh, like a gin, uh, a gin margarita, you know, just substitute gin into tequila. So I think just getting one of each spirit uh, would be good for the home bar and maybe a little vermouth. And I would recommend leaving the vermouth in the fridge. Treat it like wine. It lasts a little longer because the proof's a little higher, but leave it in the fridge um, to keep the freshness longer. Now, that being said, it, when you create a home bar, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole because you know, you, you go to your favorite 
like watering hole or cocktail bar and you're like, oh, he makes this cocktail called the Tavern Keeps Treasure and it has a little vermouth. It has a little uh, maraschino liqueur. Um, it has a little orange bitters and Angostura bitters. And now you just added six more bottles to your home bar. So when I say it goes on a rabbit hole, it's like find what you enjoy and stick with that. Um, if you host guests a lot at home or, or tend to enjoy a cocktail at the end of the day fairly often, I think getting a, a, a good array of different styles works well too. Now you can go from something as simple as like a, a Blanco tequila, which is unaged, or a, like an extra Añejo tequila, which is heavily aged, and you make the same cocktail with different types of tequila, totally different outcome, totally different flavor profile. So yeah, that, that's, a t that's a difficult question to give you the exacts on, but if you're just a fan of whiskey, I would just get, I would get bitters, I would get whiskey, and I'd get vermouth, and you got a lot of the bases covered. I like this question. Chris is asking you, if you were stuck on a desert island, what liquor would you bring? Oh, like, <laughs> so this is a little fun fact about me. I don't even drink. I taste everything that comes in our bar, whether it be cocktails when we're making it or, or new whiskeys or new spirits. But I don't drink too often. But if I had to choose one on a desert island, I would probably choose um, a whiskey called Hakushu, which is like a, a Japanese whiskey. This is what it looks like. And I enjoy it with soda water. Now, um, it's, it's very classic. So it's a style of called a highball, which is whiskey and soda. And I enjoy it because it's very light. It's very refreshing. Now, when you think about being stuck on an island, I'm going to drink that same cocktail for the rest of my life in the morning, in the midday, and in the night. I don't really want to drink a Manhattan at 9 in the morning on a desert island. I don't, maybe you do, Chris, but I don't. But I think uh, the easiest to enjoy cocktail would be a uh, whiskey soda. And as being Hakushu is one of my favorites, I have a little pin here actually. Um, that would be my choice. Okay, I like that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about you know preferences and things like that, which I would say come to the bar when they reopen and you can ask yeah. him yeah. Um, yourself. Yeah. Um, what one question I thought was interesting is because you know you mentioned a lot about substitutions. You know, like people are asking about can I do maple syrup instead of simple mm -hmm. sugar. Are there any like you should not like do not you know replace bourbon with scotch or do not you know is there any are there any kind of rules in your book that maybe don't maybe don't substitute for something right else? right so so there would be, I say yes and no yes in the sense of like I've been doing this for a long time and I, I kind of have an idea what works but no in the sense where like at one time I was curious just like the beginner and I, I needed to learn that now it, it usually it's the flavor profile so like. There are classic cocktails that involve multiple different, different um, types of spirits and they work really well together. And there are, there are probably 10 times as much that never made that classic list because it didn't work well together. So as far as like um, spirits go, I think I, I like to generally stay in the same lane as far as what I'm using. So if I'm gonna make a cocktail uh, like the old fashioned and I was gonna use bourbon and scotch, I would use different totally different flavor profiles but complementary in the same sense where i'd use a, a bourbon which has a lot of vanilla a lot of um, caramel notes and i'd use a whiskey that has a bit more of like that that smoky earthy note and then they would really um, come through in, on different levels when it comes to sweetness as far as honey and maple syrup go i think application is the biggest thing if if you just think about the 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 way honey works if you chill it it crystallizes so if I'm using honey in a cocktail, there's almost a guaranteed chance that I've already cut it with some water to make it uh, easier to, um, to, to be mixed together. Uh, and maple, which we use in some of our, our, our signature cocktails, we just, so I would put maple in the glass or in the mixing glass first and stir it with the ice to help that dilution. Because maple, it, will, it gets very viscous when it gets cold. So you kind of want to mix it mix it first, but yeah, I think, I wish there was a simple answer I could give you for that covers the basis of everything, but there, there isn't because there's so many different styles of spirits and mixers and, but that's also what makes this something that I was passionate about because there's no rules, you know, you can kind of write your own story. And I guess the, the final question of the evening um, as we wrap up is about you. So there are a few questions <laughs> about where did you learn yeah. uh, mixology and how, how to mix drinks? So I learned on YouTube. Um, no, 
I, I joke, but yeah, I kind of did. You know, coming up, coming up here, here in Hawaii um, and learning about cocktails was something that I, I didn't necessarily have a mentor per se when I first started. I just researched everywhere I could. I traveled when I could. And when I was out, I would see, okay, how is this guy shaking this cocktail? How is she stirring that cocktail? Like, wh what is he doing different as, as far as his um, proportions for ratios, you know? And I would read as much as I could, become knowledgeable on the spirits. And all, all at that, the, at the root of all of that was like what I love about the service or the hospitality industry. It's like storytelling and sharing, sharing that story. So um, when I was confronted to do or given the opportunity to do a Lexus Lux masterclass, it was an automatic yes, because I'm doing the same thing I do, which I love to do and sharing that story. So cocktails for me started in many different ways and ultimately led to, to, to this uh, leather apron that I opened with my business partner, Tom Park, but it was uh, all driven by passion and like uh, our, our, our wanting to share, share our story. So each cocktail kind of has a story and um, like the old fashioned, it's literally the cocktail that built this, the house that we call it. Um, the Manhattan, it's, it's, it's going to be the next big drink. You know, the daiquiri, it's like the simplest version of a classic cocktail, but it's so, so enjoyable and balanced. And, you know, so I, um, I don't even remember what the question you asked was, but that was, that's kind of my story. That's how I started just having a passion for something, learning about it and having the ability to share it with uh, all of the people who enjoy it. So, well, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. Um, it's been kind of a roller coaster of fast, slow, fast, slow, but um, it has been an honor of mine to share with you. And if you have any questions, please reach out, come to the bar when we're able to, and we'd love to see you, but thank you very much. So I just want to, um, on behalf of Surf Co. Lexus, thank Justin and Bar Leather Apron for being a part of our masterclass series. Um, and of course, thanks to all of you for taking a virtual seat here at Bar Leather Apron. Um, and a very special thank you to all of those that purchased uh, Lux Masterclass Cocktail Kit. Uh, you know, this is a difficult time, obviously, for a lot of local businesses. Uh, and we encourage all of you to continue to shop local, support local, um, especially during this time and, of course, into the future. Now, on Monday, uh, we'll be sending a recording of this Masterclass, which you can watch back later. Um, we will also be sending a survey to get your feedback on what your thoughts are about how this Masterclass went. And for the le first 100 Lexus owners to complete the survey, um, we will be giving you a complimentary Servco Lexus stainless steel cocktail shaker. So uh, the person that was asking about metal or plastic, um, if you're a Lexus owner, you will get a stainless steel cocktail shaker. Um, and for those of you that are interested um, in our next masterclass, please mark your calendar for November 22nd. The next coffee uh, topic will be coffee, uh, featuring coffee scientist and guru Sean Simon. So we're really excited for that. Um, it will be a morning masterclass, just so we won't keep everybody up through the night and through the weekend. Um, and again, um, if you haven't yet, please feel free to post your uh, cocktail photos um, and follow the instructions on Bar Leather Apen's Instagram for a chance to win a $100 gold coin, which it's a pretty cool coin. It's a pretty hefty. Um, you might even want to keep it um, um, for yourself. But of course, again, thank you again to Justin. Um, come please when they reopen, come visit them. Um, it definitely is an experience and you learn a lot. Um, what you experience today is just a fraction of the questions that you can ask and learn um, if you come here um, in person. So again, thank you for joining us this evening. Please uh, drink responsibly, drive responsibly, uh, and have a great evening. Thank you.